Welcome everyone to Grand Rounds. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Buddy Ratner today. Um, he's from the Department of Bioengineering. Uh, to give a little background on Dr. Ratner, his, he, he received his PhD from the Polytechnic Institute in Brooklyn in polymer chemistry, and then came to UW as a postdoc, and we've managed to keep him here. Um, and at this point, he is the Michael L. and Myrna Darland Endowed Chair in Technology Commercialization. He has a dual professorship in Department of Bioengineering and Chemical Engineering, um, and is an adjunct professor in the Department of Materials Sciences and Engineering. His, um, he does most of his work focusing on biomaterials that heal, um, that enhance the performance and function of medical devices. His research interests include biomaterials, tissue engineering, polymers, biocompatibility, and surface analysis of organic materials. His impact cannot be questioned, and he has greater than 300 peer-reviewed articles, 75 book chapters, and greater than 20 patents. His work has revolutionized knowledge in the field, defined new directions, and made significant clinical impact. And we're pleased to welcome him today to have him here to speak to us on biomaterials in rejuvenating medicine. So, Okay, uh, good morning, and um, appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to present Grand Rounds. Um, I, I will preface this whole talk by saying, uh, you know, we do some interesting preclinical things, if you will, but I need, uh, I need partners. Uh, as you'll see, I'm going to present what I'd like to loosely call a platform technology that has applications potentially in many, many areas of medicine. And I'm always looking for, for collaborations and people that want to uh, explore uh, some of these things further. And uh, I think the title, uh, Winning the Fibrosis Battle, uh, really does speak to a lot of uh, uh, considerable problems, if you will, in medicine. So um, uh, the roadmap here, we'll talk a little bit about this problem, issue, fibrotic healing. I'm going to talk about biomaterials and tissue engineering. I'm going to talk about um, uh, how we're achieving a vascularized healing and reconstruction with a special kind of polymer that I will describe. I think it's relatively straightforward to understand. Talk about some other strategies to achieve this uh, um, uh, vascularized healing in contrast to a fibrotic healing. And then I'm going to just uh, mention, make a few words about uh, my interests. Uh, in taking things from the, um, the lab bench and getting them into patients and getting them into the clinic. What, what is part of that process? So um, the place to start um, is uh, baby boomers. I have um, uh, pictures of some uh, illustrious and famous baby boomers sitting there. And uh, the uh, Americans, 65 plus, will more than double by 2030. We're entering this uh, interesting period, and, and then there, there's these uh, astounding costs associated with, with aging. Uh, these probably aren't terrible surprise to people, but um, uh, costs associated with chronic diseases uh, in, in the U.S., uh, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, stroke, diabetes, greater than, uh, than $250 billion per year. Heart disease is projected by 2030 to increase to maybe $800 billion a year. Hips and knees uh, prices are uh, will steadily going up, a uh, projection is to 54 billion by 2030. These are huge numbers. And um, in fact, uh, some people who've done some economic analysis said that due to aging populations, these costs will literally bankrupt government health care systems. Uh, and uh, th these uh, ideas actually came from the British system uh, that uh, provides, uh, I think, a health care in a very different manner from the US system. But they are very concerned if they can give this uh, uh, excellent and, uh, if you will, um, free to the patient care to a large population, given these increasing costs. So people are thinking about costs. So uh, from my standpoint, I think we can um, talk today. We can maybe invest in, in uh, palliative technologies. It's what we primarily do in medicine. But in the future, I think there are good models to say if we could regenerate, restore, actually heal, uh, we could um, have some uh, great cost to the healthcare system and do some things for patients that we've never been able to do before. 
So um, I'm going to get to uh, this regenerative medicine thing shortly, but really the roots of this talk lie in um, uh, a field I call biomaterials. It's, uh, I came here in 1972 to work on biomaterials. I did my PhD thesis before that. So I, I've been doing this quite a while. And uh, it, it's interesting how important uh, the University of Washington is as a place for biomaterials. Um, uh, you'll find this plaque, uh, it was on a building in Capitol Hill. It, it now resides in the Kidney Research Institute. But on this site in 1962, the world's first artificial kidney center was, was open. And that became possible due to the work of uh, Belding Scribner, a nephrologist uh, here, and Wayne Quinton, who invented this uh, shunt using some very early biomaterials. They had, uh, they had some Dacron, they had some Teflon, they had some silicone, and they figured out a way to get continuous access to uh, patient blood for uh, uh, ongoing uh, uh, hemodialysis. So Les Babb was a chemical engineer and actually did the uh, mechanical systems on the hemodialysis equipment. But Seattle is famous. We're on the map as one of the pioneering places for bringing synthetic materials uh, to medicine. So if we uh, shoot way to the, to the present time, we, we can look at a, a, just a couple of um, uh, called a relatively glib examples of um, uh, medical devices. Uh, and, and the interesting thing, I, I don't even want to dwell on describing these different devices. They'll be familiar to most people in the room. Uh, is the numbers per year we're putting into, uh, in, into humans. And they're very impressive numbers. And we do this year after year, so they must basically work. But uh, there are also considerable issues with, with these uh, synthetic material devices that go in. And these uh, intraocular lenses, for example, have a, a significant reoperation rate. Um, the hip and knee joints uh, have a limited lifetime, and, uh, which uh, impedes using them in younger people. Uh, vascular prostheses do not heal well, and we still don't have a small diameter vascular graft. Uh, heart valves calcify and thrombose uh, devices through the skin, percutaneous devices, still do not seal to the skin, and one gets uh, some infection problems. Electrodes fail due to encapsulation. I, I, I could continue reading. It's an interesting list, and, and actually in our courses, we, we almost spend a, a whole part of the course on, on just going through these things. But the FDA has a, has a website. It's uh, called the Adverse Event Reporting System. And if a device shows problems or complications, it, it's the obligation of the medical device company to relay that information back to the FDA. So in 2009, they received 580,000 reports of adverse events with implanted medical devices. And by 2013, it was up to over a million uh, uh, adverse events. So there's a, a considerable issue with these medical devices that are going into millions of people, are certainly doing some good in medicine, but uh, uh, have a tremendous complication rate too, and complications are traumatic for the patient and increase costs. So the, the opportunities here to reduce adverse events, to uh, get improved healing, to uh, maybe develop infection-free medical devices, to uh, take advantage of some of the new ideas in, in regeneration, reconstruction, and ultimately to reduce costs, the whole accountable care idea. Uh, and these are huge opportunities, and opportunities are um, something we uh, really want to bring on to particularly the next generation of researchers. So uh, I'd say a lot of our 2015 thinking, um, our, our problem on the present thinking we have, uh, is how we think about this, this word biocompatible. I'm sure it's a word everybody has heard, probably used it. And um, we talk about biocompatible biomaterials. And, and, and biocompatibility, as far as the manufacturers of implant devices, is defined by a, an ISO standard, uh, ISO 10993. And basically, if you look, uh, you analyze the 6,000 pages in this ISO document, it comes down to three ideas that, that uh, basically the material will not be leaching anything that's toxic, the, uh, uh, or the material of the medical device. Uh, there will be no endotoxin on the, pre on the surface um, that, that will uh, elicit a strong inflammatory reaction. And upon implantation, one sees this, uh, what's called a foreign body reaction, a thin bar foreign body capsule. And, and so if you look at this, uh, these criteria, 
uh, and then start looking at some things, the, the materials we use in medicine today. Uh, these are what I'd call some uh, biocompatible biomaterials that fit every criteria. And in fact, we're widely using these in medicine. So titanium, we make aircraft out of it and we put it in people. Silicon rub, we caulk our bathtubs with it and put it in people. Uh, we use a Dacron in, in many devices, and that's indistinguishable from what uh, DuPont puts into a shirt. Uh, polyurethanes, if you look at the soles of your shoes, you'll find polyurethanes, and we use them very widely in medicine. Uh, alumina, used in some uh, medical devices, really uh, sapphires or uh, uh, rubies, uh, both alumina, by the way. Um, we have uh, uh, polymers used uh, in electronics, the polyether ether ketones. Uh, cellulose, uh, polyethylene, these are all pretty, they, they look pretty mundane, actually. It's kind of the common junk we're putting in people. But these meet the criteria of biocompatibility. And, and then you look at what's going on here. So if this thing here is, is uh, an implant biomaterial, we're going to put it in, in a body, and within seconds, there's going to be a layer of proteins on the surface. And uh, sometime up, maybe at 48 hours, these cells call the macrophage. Um, and enter the, uh, the healing site uh, where this implant was and, and start interrogating the materials. They are programmed by evolution to um, get rid of foreign objects and they attempt to flatten out the phagocytose, uh, the implant, and, and they find uh, titanium, silicone, polyethylene, they find this quite indigestible. So uh, eventually they just call in some other, send out some signals, call in some other cells and the body puts a uh, fibrotic or a foreign body capsule uh, around the material. Um, here's a, a kind of an interesting illustration of this. This is a scanning electron microscope, of, uh, uh, my, my, uh, scanning electron uh, micrograph <coughs> of a um, Teflon device. The device actually is a glucose sensor, and it's been uh, in a rack for six weeks. And um, uh, I think it clearly illustrates the issue we have here. Uh, this is what normal tissue looks like in a scanning electron microscope view. It's kind of open, diffuse. It allows diffusion of many things. And here's our Teflon device that has to receive glucose from the vascularity in that tissue. And here we have this dense capsule that is um, uh, inhibiting uh, the transport of glucose. So this is why we don't have long-term implantable glucose sensors yet because of this reaction that shuts off the uh, ability of the sensor to read glucose. Uh, you can also see some uh, white cells, uh, as we'll see in a little while, they're macrophages at the interface. So uh, what, are, what are the problems with this encapsulation? Um, you know, it's the reaction we get, it's the reaction the FDA accepts for something that, that uh, achieves this stamp biocompatible. But uh, we get walling off electrodes, walling off of implanted sensors, walling off of drug delivery systems. Breast implants have this problem with capsule contracture. IOLs are encapsulated. One gets uh, poor bone healing uh, due, to, due to kind of fibrotic uh, capsular reaction. Pacemaker healing can be very poor. Vascular grafts get this dense fibrotic sheath around them. Uh, maybe it's even related to device-scented infection because this uh, capsule is really very avascular. And the phagocytic cells, the might deal with infection, are uh, inhibited from getting to the device. So uh, give some more specific examples. Um, this is uh, a, a, an article in Expert Reviews in Ophthalmology, New Devices in Glaucoma Surgery, talking about glaucoma drains. And uh, reactive, fibro reactive fibrosis results in the long-term failure of these devices to drain intraocular pressure. We can go to hydrocephalus shunts. And um, excessive fibrosis around ventricular catheter and shunt malfunction. Uh, here, here's some work we did a few years ago on um, um, <clears throat> uh, attempting to do a. Um, uh, well, actually, let me put this in context. We were looking at why um, the delivery catheters on um, uh, pumps that pump insulin, insulin delivery pumps. A fail after three to five days. And um, really, there was no uh, information on it. So we developed an implant system, fully implant system, so the, the mouse couldn't scratch the thing out. And uh, we could examine the exit site of the uh, insulin delivery catheter at various time periods. And what did we find? This is a, a stain called trichrome, Missan's trichrome. 
and dark blue is dense collagen. And what we find uh, at the exit site is dense collagen, dense collagen, dense collagen, and lots of uh, uh, inflammatory cells, of macrophage in particular. So um, again, the fibrosis, I think, is leading to the failure of, of the short-term failure of these uh, uh, insulin delivery catheters. So these types of concerns, and it goes on and on really, led to a 10-year search funded by the National Science Foundation for strategies to bypass this reaction, the foreign body reaction, and it led to some very interesting uh, engineered porous polymers. So uh, we use a lot of porous materials in, in medicine, um, widely used in many types of medical devices. And um, the, um, uh, this, this is just one type of material. And, and the issue with this, when we started examining the materials that we used in medicine, was that uh, it had a very broad distribution of pore sizes. There were large pores, there were medium-sized pores, there were small pores. We started asking the question, um, what if there was an ideal pore size? Um, for materials like this and all the other materials we use in medicine, we really couldn't, couldn't tell. So we invented a, a way to make a material with one and only one pore size. And we started with, with microspheres, and we uh, sieved them to get a very uniform size cut, all of the same size. We shook them so they packed, close packed, like close packed oranges at a grocery. Uh, we gently heated them so they centered or fused with each other. Then we surrounded them with a, uh, a, a monomer liquid. We polymerized to make a polymer surrounding it. And then we extracted out the microspheres themselves. So this gave us a porous material where every pore was the same size. And where the spheres were centered together, we got interconnects between the pores. And you can see the um, uh, one example. I have a better picture of this type of material here. <coughs> um, each pore is uh, uh, identical in size. This is a cut through the material. The black dots are where the spheres were centered together. This is what the microspheres look like. Uh, by the way, I'll use this terminology, uh, uh, sieve, shake, center, surround, solidify, solubilize, success. I'll use this, and it has led to considerable success, as you'll see. So um, this is the, um, uh, again, what the material looks like. Here's a, here's a big piece of it, and you can see how uniform this pore structure is across large pieces of this material. Uh, in, in recent years, we've actually been trying to uh, computer model what this stuff looks like, and, and these are what close-packed spheres look like together when they're perfect and, and the interconnects. And uh, we're, we're actually thinking about in the future, rather than using that technique, of 3D printing it. And one of my uh, colleagues invented an absolutely remarkable 3D printer. I'll just show it to you here that we hope to be using for this. Uh, this is a bath of monomer. And um, this is a, a slightly accelerated time, but uh, not too much. And uh, uh, just watch as this three carbon 3D printer uh, pulls right out from the vat of liquid. This is being created in real time. Uh, a, um, uh, well, I don't want to rush the thing, but it's actually printing a uh, Eiffel Tower. Uh, literally pulled out of a vat of liquid. And we're hoping to use that same technology to print these things in the future. So this, uh, this made actually the cover of Science Magazine, if you saw this a few, few weeks ago. Um, OK. Uh, so anyway, uh, we, we were able to make these materials now with one, with one and only one pore size. And um, the, um, uh, we, we, we came across an observation that hadn't been seen, seen in the whole history of uh, medicine and biomaterials, that if the pore size was about 35 microns or so, the, uh, on the y-axis in both cases, we're plotting vascular density. If the pore size is about 35 microns, we've got huge vascular density. You can see it here with error bars. And uh, basically, we got a, a rather non-fibrotic healing. The pore size was smaller or larger. We've got the classic foreign body reaction. The pore size was in this sweet spot. We got this, this very nice healing. We've done other studies uh, to find out if those blood vessels that we counted are, in fact, functional blood vessels. And so we used a perfused lectin to label uh, uh, functional system. And sure enough, the 40 micron has the uh, largest number of perfused blood vessels. And we examined um, this reaction uh, further. The 
what we're looking here again, this is this uh, stain, the trichrome, uh, the Massan's tri tri trichrome stain that stains a dense collagen, or particularly dense collagen, comes out dark blue. And this uh, material here, this is the biomaterial. This is, uh, uh, it's called polyheme, and it's the material of the original soft contact lens. It's been used in medicine for 60 years. And it's implanted, and sure enough, we have this thin, dense capsule separating the normal tissue from the polyhema. If we use a 34 micron material, now note how different this is. The, um, th this is what the capsule looks like. It's almost nothing here uh, compared to the look of the tissue. And we see uh, extensive uh, infiltration of cellular material. And then uh, if we look at a, a large pore, 160 micron pores, we start to see a lot of this dense collagen, again, forming within and around the material. You can see the uh, uh, the uh, uh, collagen uh, interface here. So uh, something very special about that 34 micron. Um, we, um, let's see. Here. We uh, uh, also implanted this in collaboration with Chuck Murray and, and the uh, Institute of Stem Cell, uh, 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 Stem Cell Institute here. We uh, implanted um, these materials directly in heart muscle. And uh, so heart muscle, of course, loves to scar. And uh, what we have here is the capsule thickness and uh, solid material. We have a, a pretty classical capsule, about 150 microns. 60 microns, about the same size capsule. Uh, 30 and 20 microns have a thinner capsule. But look, look at the trichrome staining uh, corresponding to this. You see in the solid, dense blue, 60 micron dense blue, 30 micron. Look how light and diffuse the collagen is. It's a very open collagen rather than this. And by 20 microns, we're starting to get a darker blue color already, which is suggestive that, uh, again, we're getting a very different kind of healing here. Uh, still another example, we said, let's compare this to a, a more classical porous material, a porous Teflon, a Gore-Tex, widely used again in medicine. And uh, we're looking at some blood vessel density here. I'll go back to that. I have this quantified in the next slide, so I won't talk about it here. But this is a stain just for cell nuclei, looking at total cell populations. And you can see for the Gore-Tex, uh, right at the interface, there's this heavy concentration of, um, of cellular material, <coughs> where um, for the 30 micron 6S material, you can hardly even see there's an interface there. There's the same, similar numbers of cells inside and outside the material. A uh, very, very different reaction. And this uh, shows the, compares the number of blood vessels based on a staining of uh, endothelial cell staining of uh, our uh, 6S material versus the porous Teflon. And you see the sort of no comparison in blood vessel generation. Uh, th that sort of uh, basic data uh, intrigued the interest of, uh, of some of my friends and colleagues in dermatology. I'm very pleased that uh, John Olerud, who is one of the co-authors on this paper, came out here. But John uh, and his group developed a um, uh, a model of implanting um, rods of this uh, 6S material right through the back <coughs> of mice. And in doing that, one could uh, uh, take a cut and actually examine both the epidermal healing and the dermis underneath. And what one found was, uh, uh, this is a pan-keratin antibody staining, that uh, a, uh, the epidermis literally grew right through and the dermis reconstructed. So the conclusion, uh, again, written by uh, the colleagues in dermatology, was sphere-templated polymers with 40 micron pores demonstrate an ability to recapitulate key elements, both the dermal and epidermal layers of the skin, the skin reconstructed. Uh, we're also doing a bunch of studies with, uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Paul Manor, uh, Paul's uh, orthopedic surgeon here, mostly does a lot of hips and knees, but also uh, trained at the NIH and is a very skilled uh, uh, researcher. And Paul's uh, animal model uh, is rabbits uh, for bone healing. But he likes not just rabbits, but old rabbits, because old rabbits heal slowly like maybe older people. So um, we, uh, uh, the, the model basically involved drilling a divot in the bone, putting in this 6S material, and looking how this material could support uh, bone healing. And uh, at 12 weeks, we found uh, extensive new bone growing in where the unfilled divot just filled with clot and, and basically became a mess. There's really nothing you could define there. <clears throat> we could also take that to uh, a micro CT so we could measure mineral, min mineralization 
as the bone grew into the divot that was created here. And we could see in essentially every case, uh, the empty socket had much lower percent bone regrowth, had much lower uh, bone growth, uh, empty filled, empty filled. We got uh, essentially in every case uh, much better bone growth with these materials. So this was, was kind of expected, unexpected, if you will, in the bone um, healing area, and that the material was this material with soft contact lens. People would say that's not really a bone <clears throat> or an orthopedic type material. And we used uh, no uh, the BMP2 cytokines, no stem cells, no osteoblasts, no hydroxyapatite. And most people in the, uh, in, in the orthopedic or bone healing area feel you need pores that are large, 200 microns or more. We did it with 35 micron pores, very unexpected. Uh, another one of my collaborators, uh, Dr. Kung Shen in ophthalmology here, uh, started some uh, studies on uh, healing in the, uh, uh, in the sclera. Uh, and so um, here's the material in the sclera, and this is uh, made of a silicone rubber. And you can see that, again, uh, this is the, uh, uh, the sclera, and you can see extensive ingrowth and, and almost no interface between the sclera and the material. Sclera also loves to fibrose. So, uh, and uh, we also made this out of, that was a silicone rubber, a very hydrophobic material. We also made it out of a hydrogel. And again, you can, you can see it three different magnifications here, where you can see the conjunctiva and the sclera, and here's where the, uh, basically the implant was, uh, was presented, uh, um, and uh, you look at three magnifications. By the time you get to the highest magnification, you can see there's essentially no interface between the sclera. The sclera just grows in and integrates. Well, we started getting all these kinds of great data and figured maybe there's something to protect here, protect the intellectual property. So we filed a, a patent on uh, porous biomaterials. Uh, it was issued in 2011. Uh, I think it's a very special patent because we patented nothing. We didn't patent the biomaterials, we patented the holes. And this is uh, kind of unique. So it's a patent on nothing. But um, the, uh, the patent, once you can do that, you can spin off a, um, uh, a company to take advantage of that protected intellectual property. And we spun off the company uh, Helionics, uh, so with the full disclosure, I'm a founder, board member, and a shareholder in Helionics. But um, Helionics, uh, the mission is to take these sphere template materials and bring them to clinical medicine. And one of the first places they did was um, <coughs> Uh, brought them to a, uh, actually a, a, veterinary sur a, a veterinary surgical company. And uh, this company was making a glaucoma drain for dogs. So dogs get glaucoma too, they go blind. Uh, it turns out though in humans where there's no pain associated with the increase in intraocular pressure, the dogs actually, it's kind of agonizing apparently for the dogs. So the owners and the dogs are anxious for a therapy. And this particular company um, uh, advanced, uh, let's see, um, well, the company is TR, basically. But uh, the company was making a, a, a glaucoma drain uh, rather similar to those used in humans, and they failed after three months, typically. And they started making it out of our material, uh, which they called Clarify. They uh, trade named it that. And uh, they found these were going 40 and 50 months uh, with, uh, with no failure, uh, continuing to reduce the intraocular pressure. And that led us to take it to humans. And we uh, actually, a Helionics spun off a company that opened in, in Belgium. Uh, and the company is called iStar Medical. And they've uh, branded this device made of our uh, porous material. They've branded it Starflow. Um, and uh, it's in about 100 humans now. And uh, I think we're starting to get some real uh, excitement among the, uh, the practitioners dealing with uh, the glaucoma and that these things don't fail due to fibrosis. They keep it generate a, a dense vascular bed that drains the intraocular pressure and seems to be working. Uh, we've also looked at, uh, at wound closure, uh, or particularly catheters, percutaneous catheters. And um, uh, we have what we did in this study, let's see, a, a lot of words on this slide. But basically, we, uh, we, it was done in pigs, in a large animal, skin somewhat similar to humans. And uh, we had uh, two commercial catheters, um, a, uh, a silicone catheter and, a, and one made of a polyurethane called carbothane. And uh, uh, what we did was put over them cuffs, if you will, 
of our porous material and looked at, at uh, catheter survival uh, primarily associated with, uh, with infection days after implant. And uh, we got the considerable failure on the control silicone, uh, the, this one called carbothane. Polyurethane did a little better. But when we put the, our cuff of material, we got uh, very good uh, long-term healing. Uh, we also collaborate with another uh, startup company called Profusa Medical. And Profusa is doing a, uh, a tissue integrating oxygen sensor. How can we measure continuously oxygen in tissues, um, uh, which is particularly important in um, uh, the uh, uh, leg sites, the uh, gets per peripheral artery disease, uh, for example. And um, so um, they uh, were anxious to develop something that could address this issue. This is what a conventional oxygen sensor looks like. And this is a little rod made of our uh, 6S material that contains a dye that is sensitive to oxygen. It can be actually uh, interrogated right through the skin. And so, uh, again, the, the, the structure of the uh, rod was basically this uh, 6S structure. And this was a very interesting illustration of uh, how the blood vessels grow into this, uh, this kind of porous material. And uh, between the interstices in this structure, we had the uh, 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 sensing nanospheres that had the oxygen sensing dye. And so uh, at, at zero time, what, what, the experiment they did was uh, basically uh, in an animal. Uh, this was um, actually a pretty long implant, 170 days in, in a mouse. And the, um, uh, what they did was uh, take full oxygen uh, pressure, full oxygen tension, and then put it under reduced tension and then increase it again so they could see how the tissue responds to the oxygen chain. So here's deoxygenation. What we have here in blue is, is, the, is our 6S material, and red is the same material in a solid form, a solid rod of the hydrogel. And then the commercial needle sensor is black. And at zero, at zero time, of course, there's clot going on there, we see a, a considerable lag when the oxygen went down and a lag when the oxygen went up. Go to day 170, we, we could no longer use the, the needle sensor for 170 days, but we're comparing the solid hydrogel to the 6S material, and now we deoxygenate, and now the blood vessels are grown in in 170 days. We see very rapid response, if you look at the blue curve, uh, very, very rapid response every time we deoxygenated, where the red, which is the solid hydrogel, still shows this same lag time. So again, the uh, presence of oxygens in the proximity of a sensor will lead to much more functional sensor. So um, we kind of sum up this part. These 6S materials have shown good uh, tissue integration, subcutaneous, intramuscular, sclera. We've done some work uh, uh, in uh, healing in, in uh, vaginal wall uh, with uh, Michael Fialco, um, percutaneous in heart muscle and bone. We've done some work with tumor models I won't discuss here. But uh, we've also used different kinds of polymers, uh, this hydrogel, the silicone, polyurethanes. We've even made them out of fibrin. So, so why this universal healing? Why, if the pore size is right, do we get healing in all these different sites? Well, one clue was to look at uh, the invasion of macrophages. And this is a, a stain, a brown, the brown stain. Uh, it's a BM8 stain for mature macrophages. Sure enough, in the 35 micron material, we see a very heavy invasion of these macrophages. And through most of history, macrophage was, was one cell and pretty much associated with inflammation. Um, but in, in maybe the last 10 or 15 years, people have realized macrophages have different flavors, different polarizations, as they call them. People talk about an M1 and an M2 macrophage now, where M1 is killing a parasite's tissue destruction, pretty classical sort of macrophage. The M2 is associated with angiogenesis and tissue remodeling. Well, that's kind of interesting. So uh, the hypothesis for what's going on is um, if, we have lar if we have a non-porous material, these macrophages come down, they spread out, they attempt to phagocytose it. If we have large pores, there's lots of room for that macrophage to still spread out and go into this phagocytic phenotype. But in the small pores, we're wondering if the macrophage can't invade. And then they get in there. The, the pores are big enough for them to get in, but they get in there, they try and spread, and maybe they're mechanically constrained. It's uh, very interesting because instead of using a pharmacologic approach, we're affecting the, the biomechanics of the cell. Um, 
So, um, so maybe these small pores have this M2 phenotype. <clears throat> and uh, again, a lot of data in this particular slide. But these are uh, heart muscle implants. And uh, sure enough, the uh, 40 microns here have uh, considerable M2 where the solid material gets all this M1, but we don't get this in the porous materials. And then there's a mixed phenotype, M1, M2. It's kind of complicated. Uh, we've done some further work on, on this M2 phenotype. <clears throat> and um, uh, this is a micrograph showing uh, the uh, 6S material with essentially no interface to the um, uh, tissue. And then if you stain just generally for macrophages, you find about equal number of macrophages in and out. But the M2, interestingly, reside just outside the material. That kind of surprised us. We thought they'd be in the material. But we see the M2 uh, just out. This is the biomaterial, the 6S. And they're outside there. So the work actually opened some intriguing hypotheses about what's going on. We're still uh, exploring that. But it did lead to, uh, I'm very proud of this actually, in the annals of biomedical engineering, we got the most cited article based on that, uh, that piece of work. And um, uh, let me just add one more element to this whole story. If we're going to really be using this in medicine, maybe we want that material to reconstruct tissue, as we've seen it can do, and then just go away. So uh, th this uh, material we've been using, this uh, polyhema, this hydrogel, is actually remarkably biostable. And uh, we set out to develop a biodegradable polyhema. And uh, so we took in the backbone of the polymer chains and in the crosslinks that hold it together, we put various biodegradable units that allow this to fall apart into small fragments that are soluble and can be cleared by the kidney. And um, so if we, uh, th this is a piece of this material set on the stage of a um, uh, confocal microscope. And uh, one of my students did this, this little video. Uh, and to speed up the reaction, the, the degradation could, be, uh, could take three or six months. But she just added some strong uh, base to uh, speed it up. And, and um, sure enough, uh, the material goes and just completely dissolves and completely gone. Uh, so we can make a biodegradable form of this material. Um, there are other, other routes we've uh, developed to get this, this uh, uh, non-fibrotic healing. I spent a lot of time on the porous materials. I'm fascinated with them because they can be relatively low cost, and they have no drugs associated with them, which is very neat. But we've uh, also used uh, what we call stealth or non-fouling materials and control a specific protein. So I'll just show you very quickly. The, the stealth idea says uh, uh, the uh, biomaterial absorbs these proteins essentially instantaneously. It goes in the body. And then the macrophages come along and attack. So what would happen if we uh, could prevent that protein from absorbing? And then the macrophages, say, maybe just couldn't recognize it, couldn't see it. It would be uh, maybe kind of a stealth material. <clears throat> so we, um, <clears throat> excuse me, in uh, collaboration with my colleague Xiaoyu Zhang, in the uh, chemical engineering department here, uh, invented a biomaterial. This is the, the structure of this polyhema. We invented a biomaterial called carboxybetaine methacrylate. Uh, structure has it's a spitherionic structure, if you're interested in the chemistry. But anyway, it, it took us actually about 18 years to get this just right so it absorbed nothing. You could put it in the body for three months, and nothing would absorb or stick to it. And so uh, if we uh, look at the uh, collagen density as a distance from the implant, um, the uh, polyhema, the classic hydrogel, you can see the dense capsule. Uh, here's the, the, actually the implant, and here's the dense capsule, and here's normal tissue. So the collagen density decreases. The, uh, here's the implant of this carboxybetaine methacrylate, and no capsule at all at three months uh, in an animal. And we could also look at blood vessel density. The carboxybetaine methacrylate has generated nice blood vessels, very few blood vessels associated with the polyhema, the conventional hydrogel. And again, we could look at this M2 and find the M2 is vastly increased in the carboxybetaine methacrylate. Uh, and the M1 is increased in the, in the solid material. So again, we're starting to get a, a consistent picture of what, what really drives this kind of non-fibrotic healing. Uh, we also uh, uh, embarked uh, to find uh, uh, protein or biological, direct biological clues that could um, uh, lead us there. And 
Our group, uh, over many years with many collaborators, explored many interesting proteins. And um, particularly work with Paul Bornstein and Themis Kyriakidis, we uh, uh, defined a number of systems that could modulate this classic foreign body reaction. So the biomaterial typically has macrophages or giant cells at the interface, a dense capsule, few blood vessels. And if you uh, uh, take this, this protein thrombospondin 2 and knock it out, uh, we find that we can get a, a, a very open capsule that's, that's filled with blood vessels. Uh, if you take this protein spark and knock it out, you can get a much thinner capsule. The, the uh, macrophage chemotactic protein 1 uh, led to a uh, elimination of giant cells. So what we're seeing here is a lot, of, a lot of papers, a lot of work that was published that went into this one cartoon. What we're seeing here is, is there's evidence we can directly manipulate this reaction by understanding the proteins that contribute to it. OK, let me just uh, uh, start to, to wrap up some concepts. Uh, people have heard the term tissue engineering, and uh, I've talked a lot about biomaterials. And so we have uh, famous uh, illustrations. It's sometimes called the Bacanti mouse. The Joe Bacanti is a pediatric surgeon in Boston, and Bob Langer uh, published the basic concept that allowed one to take a scaffold, seed it with chondrocyte cells, and show that it could regenerate a cartilage-like structure that was histologically indistinguishable from normal cartilage. Uh, it got a lot of press, and in fact, a lot of um, the ethics people kind of really dumped them for doing this kind of work. Uh, in any event, those, those sort of experiments led to, um, let's call it much hype. This was in Business Week uh, uh, in uh, 1997, I believe. And they talked about new era of regenerative medicine coming with We'll be able to generate bone and skin and pancreas, uh, urinary tract, bladder, cartilage, breast, all sorts of tissues. Again, the, it was uh, very um, uh, visionary, but there really wasn't much there. But, uh, uh, you know, we, we flash again to the present time. We can go out and buy uh, this material dermograph that's a scaffold containing living fibroblasts kept in a minus 70 degree freezer. And uh, in, uh, in burns and wounds, one can just unpack this put it on the, the uh, uh, patient and get uh, vastly accelerated uh, and improved uh, much less fibrotic wound healing due to the presence of these living fibroblasts in this. So uh, tissue engineering, we have a lot of different ways to do this. Uh, we, have, uh, we can seed cells on, uh, on, on porous scaffolds. That's uh, the um, uh, method that, that uh, Langer and Bacanti did in, in that ear. But the cells can be in gels, or they can be encapsulated, or people are actually trying to, to print uh, tissues and organs now. It's actually been quite a big field. Uh, and uh, people uh, put together uh, tissues by stacking up cell sheets. So um, uh, this gentleman, Thomas Boland, uh, one of my former PhD students, who's now a professor in the University of Texas, actually invented this whole idea of bioprinting. He had the weird idea. They could take a Hewlett Packard printer, clean out the print cartridges, fill them with living cells, put a computer model of what a tissue might look like, and squirt the cells out and make the tissue. Uh, totally bizarre idea, but now there are uh, 20 companies doing it. There's 100 people, 100 researchers doing it. And you go to a tissue engineering meeting, you find days of sessions on this idea of actually printing uh, living tissues. It's pretty amazing. So what we find here is that the uh, sort of biomaterials and tissue engineering are very uh, closely related. Uh, but you know, if you compare some differences, biomaterials and our, uh, or the medical devices that go into them, basically a $300 billion worldwide market where tissue engineering is just evolving and nobody even knows what the market is. And biomaterials are helping uh, millions. A few people have tissue engineered products. There's some tracheas, there's some cartilage replacement. Uh, some skin replacement, but pretty low, really. Uh, but in both biomaterials and tissue engineering, both depend on scaffolds and biomaterials. So biomaterials are used in both. Both are seeking clues from modern biology. And uh, biomaterials have had sort of steady growth over some 50 years, really no sign of a slowdown in the increase. But the tissue engineering has seen kind of explosive growth. And tissue engineering got recognized just a few days ago. Uh, this is Bob Langer who came out with that original paper. Bob's quite a visionary professor at MIT. And he's uh, receiving the um, 
the Queen Elizabeth Prize in Engineering, a, a million pound prize uh, for his work in tissue engineering, and that was just October 26th, really, just a few days ago. So uh, tissue engineering is kind of getting well recognized. Uh, to pull into the home stretch here, I just want to talk a little about commercialization uh, of these ideas. And um, so one of the issues I have to deal with is that academic scientists don't manufacture devices. And, and a paper in science cannot directly save lives. Somehow we have to get the information in that paper out to, to patients. And the taxpayers basically fund pretty much everything we do in research. Uh, how do we repay the taxpayers? Our paper in science doesn't really repay them, but getting something from the lab bench to the clinic that can directly help them pays. And, and so I, I, this quote uh, or a uh, little story of Prime Minister Gladstone visiting Michael Faraday's lab asked him whether this esoteric substance called electricity could ever have practical value. And so Faraday replies, one day, sir, you will tax it. Nobody knew what it was for, and I think this does talk about the idea of basic science going into, in, into commerce. The interesting thing, you'll find this story all over the, the web, and it uh, turned out that Gladstone and Faraday lived about 30, 40 years apart. They couldn't have possibly met, and uh, so it's totally apocryphal, but it's a good story. <laughs> um, so uh, what are the barriers that are, that are inhibiting us? Well. Uh, what I call university naivete. Universities tend to um, believe in the value of their technology a little too much. And uh, technology can be valued if it's used properly. But in, in just its kind of raw form, a patent issued, it's really not that valuable. So universities have often overpriced and, and frightened away industry. And there's a, a basic risk aversion in the whole field. Uh, Technology barriers, we've got to do it. It's, it's harder to do tissue engineering. We've got, the, of course, the regulatory agencies. The FDA is a little frightening. The whole reimbursement idea can be frightening. Physician conservatism. These are all barriers that uh, inhibit getting into the patient. So we have um, basically a list of, and I, I will not read this list, of a bunch of considerations that you have to think about for medical device commercialization. I'm actually teaching a course on this right now. Uh, and identifying the need or opportunity and who will buy it, what the market size is, and what company will make it. I've got a bunch of these questions. I don't have time to go through it, but there's, there's, there's a system, uh, a mechanism that uh, you can use to get a good idea from uh, uh, the, the lab bench uh, into commercialization and finally into patients. So to, to conclude, to, to tie it up, uh, I think uh, so maybe an inert synthetic polymer can have almost a pharmacologic effect controlling healing or regeneration. Uh, I think the exploration of the basic biology of healing can lead to some new strategies. Scar healing can be replaced with vascularized reconstruction. Do we need cells and tissue engineering? Maybe all we need are the macrophages. They seem to be doing a lot of the work. And uh, the importance of this M1 and M2 thing, we're still working on this. We just got an R01 funded to actually uh, understand this better, so we're pleased with that. So I have also what a modern paper, sometimes like a graphic summary, they call it. So uh, through much of history, it was kind of a, a sort of heal thyself, a scar would form. Then we had the, uh, the era of uh, replace the park, plastic and metal. And I think we're heading into a, a new era of regeneration and tissue engineering. We have a uh, large team at the University of Washington here. This is not even everybody. These are some of the biomaterials researchers, many professors in the front line. The uh, whole uh, unit or, or bi biomaterials effort here was founded by Professor Alan Hoffman. Uh, and uh, this is uh, some of the uh, students and faculty working on biomaterials. Have to thank the, uh, the NIH and, and uh, UWeb program was funded by the National Science Foundation. And um, my students, staff, and colleagues who obviously contributed tremendously to this. And let me just put up uh, the last thing as a plug. We have a lecture coming up today at 4 p.m. Uh, by Professor Molly Scheuchert. Uh, Molly um, won recently the uh, uh, L'Oreal UNESCO uh, World Award for her work. Uh, I was walking through uh, Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris. There's a huge poster of Molly hanging right, right up there uh, uh, advertising this. And Molly's won all sorts of awards, uh, about every award possible, and her work on nerve healing and neuronal healing is really brilliant. So if you want to come to the Walker Ames Room, 4 p.m., you get another really interesting lecture on biomaterials. 
With that, thank you very much.